Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now this morning, we're starting off our year and we get to do something very special. We get to take communion together. And I'd like to do that right now, if you don't mind. And a young man, Jack, he asked me when he was young, he got to go to a Catholic church. I was raised in a Catholic church. And he was just a visitor, and he was told he couldn't take communion. And he didn't understand why. His parents said, well, there's rules, and there's certain things you've got to do. And um, I, was studying to, I was studying to be an altar boy, and I knew the whole Catholic tradition ritual. You know, we go to confession on Saturday. The day before communion, conf- go in the little box. You, conf- you know, there's a little sliding thing. The priest is on the other side. And the funny part was, in our parish, we knew the priest because I went to Catholic school, the catechism. So Father McMahon was all, you know his voice. You know when you know, he's the guy that is up front. So you know his voice and you hear his voice through the cloth on the, the little screen there. And, um, you you know, Father, forgive me, it's been so... Uh, when you when you're raised Catholic, you got to go every week. So it's been a week since I was here last, and um, and then you got to confess your sins, and then he gives you some prayers to pray. So many Our Fathers, so many Hail Marys, and um, I've shared this before, but I was pretty much convinced I was the worst sinner in the whole Catholic Church, because the next day when you got to service and it came time for communion, before you we we'd go up in the line and we would get the the um host it was called, just a little wafer of the bread, the unleavened bread. And the priest would give it to you, say the body of our Lord Jesus. You stick out your tongue, you put it on your, on your tongue. And my nona would say, don't chew it. Now, I don't know if that was just a thing to keep kids quiet or what, but, but when you, have, has anyone ever had one of these wafers? They're very thin, very light, and it sticks to the roof of your mouth. And I'd be like this. I got Jesus stuck to the roof of my mouth. And she'd be like, don't chew it. I'm like, can I stick my finger in and pop him off? Because he's stuck, you know. And it's just a child's understanding. But, but she's like, no, just suck on it. And then, of course, that just keeps you. And it just, it doesn't come off. It just stays there. Well, during the time when you were taking the host, you were supposed to kneel down in the pew and say your prayers of penance. And so, so many, our fathers, so many, depends how bad you were that week. And the reason I say I was the worst is because while I'm praying, I, I sp- and by the way, I could pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom of the will be done on earth to me. Like, like, speed pray. I mean, I could go through that prayer so fast. But when you have 30 of them to do, <laughs> and then you've got to do Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord's with you, and you, you know, you, you have to sp- sprinkle those in because you've got, you know, another 15 of those. And then you look around, and everyone has gone from the kneeling position so they've already sat down, and they're waiting for the priest to continue this. Oops. Ooh, that was close. I almost sat on my communion. Thank you, Dot. So, that would be embarrassing, you know, right there. That would be terrible. Okay, I am stained? She's, she's rascaling me, Dot. Okay, so... I'd sit up, and, and, and by the time, I mean, I kind of, you know, as a little kid, I'd look around, and everybody is sitting waiting for me. And without, without anyone saying anything, just the child's m- mind, you know, you start thinking, I have to be the worst sinner in the whole church, because I, and I'm praying as fast as I can. And, and I, I'm like, kind of, you're not allowed to ask you're taught this. Don't ask the person next to you how many Our Fathers did you get, you know, or how many. It, it was like a poor taste to do that. But I was starting to wonder because if I couldn't get through it that fast, I must have really, you know, the priest is probably going, yeah, you're a handful. And so, so we had to confess our sins. Now that teaching, by the way, is biblical, and I want to show you where we get it. In the book of uh, of Corinthians, when Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. They were a really carnal church. We just studied this with the youth group last night, the older kids. But in 1 Corinthians, if you'd like to look on, you're, you're welcome to, or I'll read it to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have uh, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he 
he shares something beautiful here that is one of my favorite passages. He says that, now, now those of you that are students of the Bible, do you remember, was Paul, Paul was called an apostle, right? Was Paul one of the 12 that was at the table with Jesus, you know, at the Last Supper? No. His apostleship was ordained by the Lord after Christ had died and resurrected. And he had actually been a persecutor of the church. He was Saul of Tarsus. And he had a letter from the priest that he could arrest anyone that, that belonged to the way. That's what they called the early church, the way. Which, by the way, someone just asked me this yesterday. Mike and I were talking. Um, he, he says he, he, he was introduced to Christ in a movement in the 70s. Uh, was it late 70s? Uh, the, the, called the way. And I said, well, you know that that's actually the first name of the church in the Bible, in the book of Acts. The, the believers were called that they belonged to this group called the way. Why, why the way? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets the Father except through me. So the early believers all said, we belong to the way, that one way to God. Well, if you had to study Latin like I did, you know what Catholic comes from in the Latin, and it actually means the universal answer or the way. It's actually the, it's, it's, it, it is the Latin for the very words we use in the, in the book of Acts, the way. Because it's saying this is the only way. And the early Catholic Church, this is 400 AD, 400 years after Jesus lived, that's when the Catholics that term came about. Instead of calling the church the way, it morphed into Catholic. And so the church be, and then it became the state religion, those of you that know world, you know world history, and that's when the church got pretty corrupt. Whenever you try to make it mandatory for people to do this, does that work? No. So, big failure. But just so you know a little history about it, and your friend that says, I'm Catholic, oh, you belong to the way. No, I don't. Just look up Catholic in Latin. Find out the root. You'll find out. It's the universal answer, or also translated, by the way, from the book of Acts, the way. I'm real good with languages. So I, I, when you're forced to learn Latin as a little kid, and you speak Italian at home, you don't even speak English, and then you go to school and have to learn English, which you figure out is really kooky. One of the hardest languages ever is English. Those of you, there's some of you say, only speak one language, English. I said, God bless you. That's the hardest one. The rest are easy. I mean, all the Romance languages all come from Latin. Spanish, French, you know. They're really easy. Once you know a little Latin, you can pick up all of those. And so this stuff is, to me, exciting. Like, this is the way. The way to God. Now, Paul, not being at the table with Jesus at the Last Supper when we studied in Matthew 26, 26, he had to learn about communion from who? Anyone know where he got his, his communion knowledge? I mean, because he teaches it right to the... Let me show you. He doesn't hear it from one of the other apostles and say, this is what I heard from Peter happened at the table, or John told me, or... Uh, no. Listen, right here. I'm going to show you who taught him about communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received... From the Lord, that which I deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is what? Broken for you. Do this in remembrance of who? Of me, he said. Paul says he learned about communion from the Lord. Now, now remember in the book of Acts when the Lord came when Saul was persecuting the Christians and Jesus, it says, appeared to him brighter than the sun at high noon and said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? And he, I call it gib slapped him, you know, smacked him on the back of the head. He, he went blind and he had to be led by the hand into town. It said for the next three days, the Lord revealed to him all that he would suffer for the sake of Christ. Nice intro to your Christian faith, right? You're going to have a conversion, buddy, and you are going to suffer. But had he made anyone else suffer? Oh, yeah. He had had Christians beaten, killed, imprisoned. 
And the Lord said, it's kind of how, God's very just. You know, you're, I'm going to save your soul, but buddy, you put a lot of people through it and you're going through it for me now. From per- persecutor of the gospel to proclaimer of the gospel. Paul would become a, a marvelous instrument and, and a true instrument of the grace of God. Because he says, I'm only saved by grace. He knew it wasn't because he was a good guy. He knew he was saved because of grace. Well, he said he received this message about communion from the Lord himself. So somewhere, I think, in those three days, you know, in between all that he's going to suffer, Jesus said, let me tell you what I did for you. I suffered. And I had my body. It was broken for you. And he said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, you guys know in the same way, at the supper, and and he said, this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. Do this, he says, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, as often as you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until the Lord comes again, us as Christians, every time we take communion, we're proclaiming Christ died for our sins. Until the Lord returns, it's the greatest proclamation there is. People say, why do you take communion? And some of you are like, it's a very private thing. I don't want to do it outside. I don't want to. I'm like, look, it's a proclamation. Christ died for my sin. But here's where Paul has to tell the Corinthian church something. News had come to him that they were, they were a carnal. I mean, I told the kids last night, Corinth is across from Athens in the, in the just above the, the northern portion of Greece, in the Mediterranean Sea. And it's, it's a port of call in the ancient days. It's a, um, a sailor's port. And what do you get when you get sailors? You know, they have been out to sea for a while, and they come back in. What do they want? They want the bar, the pub, or the, or the brothel. You know, they're looking for the girls. And Corinth was known as a really, in the, in the day, if you called someone a Corinthian, that was like... I don't need, I, I told the kids, I was trying to think of a, like, an equivalent. They'd be like, you're a Las Vegasite. No, that doesn't quite work. You're, you're, you know, I mean, think of the worst possible, you know, places where, where there's debauchery and sin. And, and, and it's a sailor's port. I mean, really, it's, and, and, and by the way, it had a lot of wealth. Because when you have that commerce coming and going in Greece, what do you get? You know, trade and money exchanging and you get these people that become very worldly. Everything's about, you know, satisfying their flesh and, and getting stuff and having stuff, getting more stuff. And so they're very carnal-minded. And Paul has to write to them, and he says, guys, when you get ready to take communion, I've heard you're taking communion, but you're not taking it seriously. So he gives some instructions. And this is why, if you were raised Catholic like I was, And you wonder, why did they make you go to confession? It's because of what Paul wrote right here. It came from the Bible. Let me read it to you. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must first examine himself. And in so doing, then he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, he eats and drinks judgment to himself if he, if he does not judge the body rightly. And for this reason, he said, many of you are weak and sick, and even a number of you sleep. To help the kids, what's it mean by sleep back then? You're dead. They had people going to church, acting carnal as could be, hooping it up, living it up in the, in the flesh, and going to church and say, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to take communion. Who cares? And because of it, the Lord, the Lord didn't treat it lightly. He just took a few of them out. You know, some of those guys that just didn't examine. He said, let a man examine himself first. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, when I was being brought, we're supposed to introspectively look and see, God, is there something I'm doing that's displeasing to you? Before I take this communion to remember what your son did. Now listen to this. Anyone here like being judged? Can I get a volunteer? I never get any volunteers for this. I try all the time. It doesn't work. Nobody likes to be judged. And if you don't like to be judged, you're in a, well, you're in good company. None of us do. 
But you need to take to heart the very next verse of 1 Corinthians 11. It says here in verse 31, But if we judge ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. If you are to but judge yourself, it says, but when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So the Lord is saying, you don't want to be judged? Judge yourself, but do it rightly. In other words, call your sin what it is. You know, have you ever run into folks that they're, they're in a particular sin and they just, I don't have a problem. And you're like, yes, you do. I mean, whoa, you are blind, man, blind. Can you see me? You know, you're like, what is your... They are so into their sin and it has put blinders on them. And they will not call their sin sin. In fact, I know when AA first started, it was started as a Christian movement. Its roots were in church. And the first step of AA was, before you could get any help, what did you have to do? You had to admit that you had what? A problem. If you don't call your sin a sin... We can't even help you. They, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with their teaching of going through the steps, but the very first step says if you don't pass step one, you don't even get to go to step two. If you don't admit you have a problem, how can we help you? If you won't admit you have sin, you're going to have a hard time getting forgiveness for sin. Because the Bible is very clear. It just says all you have to do is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sin... God is what? Faithful and righteous, and He will what? He will free, and, and He will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He will wash away all those stains from that sin. But if we say we have no sin, those of you that know 1 John, there's a beautiful, the first chapter of 1 John, not John's gospel, 1 John, the other little epistle he wrote near the end of your Bible. There's 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. In 1st John 1, he says, if you don't, if you say, I don't have any sin, he says, you lie. There's one sin right there, liar. Okay? You're, you're a liar. And it says, you lie and the truth is not in you. You know, that's the wrong attitude to get ready to take communion to start off our year. The best way we can start off our year as a, as a group of believers is look inside and say, Lord, is there anything displeasing inside me to you? Just show me. And let, uh, it says, let a man first examine himself. You're not here to judge anyone around you. This is not, let's judge our neighbor and see what sins they have. It's you judge you. Look into your heart and say, God, I want to start off this year right with you. And if there's anything, it, you could be prideful, you, you could be envious. You could be jealous of somebody. You could, you, there's so many different sins, right, that we, that we face. But what I need you to do is look into your own heart and say, Lord, show me. Show me what displeases you so I could confess it to you. And before we take communion, we're going to do that as a prayer together. Just between you and the Lord, I want you to ask the Lord to forgive you of those things. And that way we can take communion and not have him judge us. Because if, if we don't judge ourselves rightly, who takes over judging? He does. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather just say, <laughs> you're the boss. My sin sin. You're right. <laughs> and, and please forgive me. Because is God merciful? Will he forgive? Absolutely. Let, let's do that. Let's take a moment and pray and seek the Lord. Lord, we just come to you we just still our hearts and our minds here in this place. and We just ask for your Holy Spirit now to do that work that only you can do, Lord, as you look inside each, each of us here. Cause us, Lord, to, to have our eyes open, our spiritual eyes, to see the things that displease you, that we could, we could confess them to you and we could be washed clean of those things. As we start off this new year, let us start it off aright, on the right foot, Lord, just walking clean before you, forgiven, proclaiming what your son did for us, that beautiful, beautiful gift he gave of our salvation. Let's take a moment and examine our hearts, Lord, show us.
Now let's confess to the Lord, between you and the Lord, Lord, forgive us our sins. Forgive us our pride. Forgive us the things, Lord, what we've done wrong, the areas that we have fallen short. Lord, forgive us where we don't trust you and we're scared. Lord, help our faith. Even as that man with the sick son cried out, he believed, but, but he asked that you would help his unbelief. Lord, help us, forgive us for our unbelief and, and grow us in our faith this year. As we begin this year together, Lord, we confess we're but sinners. Forgive us our sins now. And have us to help us as we forgive those that have sinned against us. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. This is a really important part of communion. Don't ever take communion flippantly and not examine yourself. Because you're just going to be e eating and drinking judgment to yourself. God will be true. He will judge. And that's part of the gospel is that He does judge rightly. So when we say it's sin, Lord, I confess it, he says, I forgive it. When we say, I ain't confessing that, I like my sin, I'm going to hang on to that. I'll warn you, you're about to see the judgment of the Lord's hand on you. And you don't want to go there. Just, just take it from a guy who knows. Just don't do it. Okay? I mean, anyone could give an amen that, that's better to just go the forgiveness route. Amen? Let's take of the bread. Those of you Bible students want to know where this is found in the Gospels, Matthew 26, 26. It says, and while Jesus was still at the supper table, you know, the last Passover, he took the bread. This is a matzah cracker. It's an unleavened bread, the same bread they use in, in the Passover meal. And he said, this is my body. Now, being raised Catholic, only the priest got to do this, but I'll, you guys get to join me today. It's not her a heresy. It's just a learning tool. Jesus, it said, was the bread of life that came down from heaven. And we take this bread in remembrance of him. And it says his body, he broke the bread. He blessed it and he broke it. So break that bread just to remember his body was broken. Remember the priest would do that? Those of you who raised Catholic, you remember he takes the host, he breaks it, he puts it together. And then he gets to partake. Let's partake of this in remembrance of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then in like manner, he took the cup. This is a cup of a new covenant in his blood. And this is for the remission, the washing away, removal of our sins. So, Lord, thanks for washing away our sins. We say to you, in Hebrew, lahaim, to life from him. Now, the funnest part... I learned this from Pastor John. When we would get all done taking communion, he say, anyone here confess your sins besides me? Raise your hand if you did. Okay, you, you know between you and the Lord. So this way you do, you say, now I'm not the one saying I forgive you, but I'm, I'm just a vessel to speak from the Lord, a message to you from him. He'd say, the Lord wants you to know your sins are forgiven. And the Bible says, though your sin was as scarlet in Isaiah, he makes it white as what? That's no. For the Hawaii kids, they don't know what we're talking about. But for those of you who grew up with snow, you know. The white as snow. He makes you clean. So he would, he would say, this is how we're starting off the year. Clean. You are clean. Every sin you ever did, the Lord has washed it away. It's gone. So time to start off the year right. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com Mahalo and God bless.